Hi there, Rick Hansen with the Amazing Greats podcast. Thank you for joining us. You know, Mother Teresa said, find your own Calcutta. Find the sick and the suffering and the lonely right where you are in your own homes and in your own families and in your own workplaces and in your own schools. You can find Calcutta all over the world if you just have eyes to see. And that is the real life story of our author and guest, Jason Porterfield. He found his Calcutta first in Camden, New Jersey, then in the urban slums of Vancouver, BC, and then in Indonesia. A confirmed peacemaker, Jason wrote the book, Fight Like Jesus. And here is his story that he tells on Amazing Greats. What an in incredible story this is. The amazing Jason Porterfield, who has just written a book called Fight Like Jesus, which caught my attention right away. It's like, wait a minute, Fight Like Jesus? Jesus wasn't a fighter, was he? So caught my attention, read the book, and loved it. But we're, we're going to get there. We're going to go to the book. But first, what I found was amazing, Jason, was that... You came from a military family. Your both parents were in the military. You went to a, a, a Baptist church, which was right next to two military bases. And you went to a Baptist Sunday school and all of that kind of stuff along the early way. How this doesn't seem like a breeding ground for an advocate of peace. <laughs> so, so how is it that all that, was there any pressure on you to go into the military initially or any of those things? Yeah, great question. So there was no pressure from my parents, though there was certainly some pressure of recruiters going through our high school, you know, to get to get kids to join the military. Um, and, and like you said, yeah, I grew up at a Baptist church, an army base, a navy base right next to the church. Um, and that was after living all over the place. You know, I moved eight times by the time I was age oh, six. So okay. we had kind of lived all over the place, but we settled in Pennsylvania, went to this pretty conservative and very patriotic um, Baptist church. And, you know, it, it's a beautiful church community to this day. I, I still have dear friendships with a lot of them, even though my theology has maybe evolved or shifted some. But they taught me to love Jesus and to love the scriptures. And it was that teaching that ultimately led me to look at some of the teaching from Jesus, like, you know, uh, when Jesus said, love your enemies, he probably meant don't kill them. So, um, yeah. but it was after that church that I, I attended a historically Anabaptist Christian college that was actually nearby called Messiah University. And it was there interacting, not so much in the classroom, but interacting with some of the Mennonite um, and other historically peace church tradition students that I began to really uh, search the scriptures and say, what does Jesus say about how to cultivate peace and love your enemies? So now when you were um, a, a kid, kid, and you and you went to Sunday school and you learned all about uh, Jesus and Christianity, uh, and a lot of times people will find that um, learning about it and then becoming uh, in relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. are kind of totally different things and it, and it changes. Was there a point in your early life that things changed, that you went from knowing about Jesus to really experiencing a relationship with Jesus? You know, I feel like a bit like Peter in that regard. There's multiple moments or baby okay. steps of kind of growing. I can't necessarily put my finger on one particular moment and say that's when the relationship really became vital. But, you know, at a very young age, I felt like I had a, a really deep love for Jesus. My mom would talk about how when we lived in Morocco at the age of five, she'd sometimes find me lining up chairs and preaching to them. You know? <laughs> um, but I, I have no memory of that. Um, but but it, going back to that Baptist church, you know, it, it wasn't just um, intellectual teaching. It, it was they taught me to dearly love Jesus and to have that, just the language that's quite common and understandably so in evangelical circles, this personal relationship with Jesus, right? Um, and so there's certainly some moments in high school I could point to. One of the, the formative moments was actually uh, in college, uh, uh, unexpected trip that I went to one day, but I can go into that if you want, or we can talk sure. about something else. If it if it unveils a story like uh, you know a good a good uh, Jesus story, I'm I'm up for it. So go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, so this was a 
a Christian college, right? And so they had required morning chapels. I think you had to go to like 25 per semester or something like that. And so it was a typical Tuesday or Thursday morning chapel. And I went down and we all sat in the gym and it was a guest speaker that day, someone I'd never met before. And when he got up and it was his turn to preach, he said, I grew up Amish, but God has called me to be a, a missionary in the city of Philadelphia. And right away that got, got my attention. You know, I've never heard an Amish person speak before. And uh, he said, you know, uh, my city, the city of brotherly love, he said, for the first time in history, more people live inside of cities than outside of them. But in Philadelphia, as soon as Christians can get enough money, they're fleeing to the suburbs. Uh, he said, that's a tragedy. And I remember sitting there on the, the bleachers listening, and, and I thought I just made an observation, but evidently God thought I was volunteering because I just said to myself, wow. If God could use an Amish person to minister in the city, I guess he could use me, a suburban boy. <laughs> and and yeah. as soon as chapel ended, you know, I joined the cattle herd of students all trying to squeeze through those two doors at the back of the gym and rush to class. And, and a friend of mine, she, she bumped into me and she's all out of breath. And she says, Jason, I just signed you up to lead a service trip to Camden, New Jersey over spring break. Camden's officially ranked the worst city in America. You don't have a choice. I know God's calling you to this. Don't back out. I was wow. flabbergasted. Right? I had spring break, break plans and it was not to go to Camden. And so... Uh, was this well, lady also going to be going as well? She was not. Oh, no. <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> so I went down to what was called the Agape Center. It was kind of the, the service and missions hub uh, at the college. And I, I said, you know, there's some guy, there was a mistake here. You know, it was my friend signed me up. I didn't sign up to this. But then they guilt tripped me and they said, well, we've got nine sophomores and freshmen signed up. They really want to go, but we need an upperclassman to lead the trip and drive the van. If you if you can't do it, we'll be forced to cancel the trip. Oh, man. <laughs> so I, there I was, guilt tripped into leading this trip. Yeah. And sure enough, a couple of weeks later, I'm driving a van full of students, fellow students uh, through Philadelphia over a bridge and into New Jersey to Camden, New Jersey. So that was your first experience then in an urban setting like that, right? It was, correct. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I had never seen such such poverty, such despair. And it was the first time I had heard of uh, environmental racism. There were numerous polluting factories, paper mills, etc., that were put right up against this, these residential communities of predominantly African-American and Hispanics. And uh, one of the people I met with there, a Christian who was a gym teacher in one of the public schools, he, he said, you know, pretty much every day, at least one kid will start breathing too hard, breathing heavy from running, and he'll end up throwing up. Most of the kids have asthma. Oh. There were 13 super fun sites in the neighborhood that I was at, and those are sites where there's so much pollution that's been put in the ground that they just fence it off because it would cost too much to try to clean it up. And of course, that pollution doesn't stop at the fence line. Yeah. But in the midst of such darkness, I also saw some, a, something beautiful I had never seen before, and it was a community of Christians who had all left good paying jobs. They all had college degrees and they had moved to what was probably the worst block of the worst city in America. And there they were just loving their neighbors. Like I mentioned, one of them was a gym teacher. You know, they weren't all just pastors or uh, working in churches. They were seeking to love their neighbors. And when I left Camden and went back to school, I remember thinking, uh, well, I thought about Mother Teresa's line. She, she had a lot of people ask to come out and volunteer in Calcutta. And sometimes she'd say yes, but often she had this saying where she'd say, Calcuttas are everywhere. If you only have eyes to see, find your Calcutta. Oh, wow. And oh, so that's wow. what I felt like God was saying to me. Here's your Calcutta. Yeah. Yeah. Find your Calcutta. Wow. So when then uh, the the organization called Servants, which you were um, uh, a key part of in the early days of of the Western, uh, tell me if I'm wrong. The the Western thing was a uh, was a whole new concept. It was a, kind of an Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern kind of um, mission, but there was a change and a, a pivot there, right? Yeah, pretty close there. So Servants was started by a New Zealander uh, who oh. began to notice uh, he was working with uh, college students in Manila and started to go home with many of them 
uh, during holidays and noticed that they all lived in slums. And so he eventually moved into a slum. And when that slum eventually got bulldozed down so they could build a shopping mall, he went back to New Zealand and formed a, a team, the first servants team to move back to Manila. Okay. And so servants, by the time I joined them, they were nearing their 25th uh, anniversary as an organization. And up until that time, all of their, their teams were located in slums of some of Southeast Asia's biggest cities. Um, and the missionaries were predominantly from New Zealand, Australia, Switzerland, England, but they were having growing interest in North America, including for myself. And so they thought, well, if we're going to set up a sending office in North America, let's try to live out these values that we feel called to live out in the slums of Asia. What would that look like in the West? And so they chose uh, to move into Canada's poorest urban neighborhood. It's a section of Vancouver known as the downtown east side. It, it's pretty small. It's about four by eight city blocks, yet it's home to uh, about 5,000 people who are experiencing addictions to drugs on any given night, 1,200 people uh, struggling with homelessness, and about 900 women trapped in prostitution. Um, and how old were you at, at, at that point? So when I was a couple years out of college. So after Camden, the first thought I had was to go through my denominations missions group, but I felt called like that community in Camden to live with the poor, not just minister to them. Um, and so I couldn't find a single one of their job openings that had that focus. And there are some theological differences as well. By that time, I was increasingly uh, convinced that that Christians should not use violence ever, and they didn't hold that stance. And so I ended up turning that group down, but that was a, a two-year process. You know, I remember my pastor at the time saying, uh, well, you've wasted it two years and you're right back to where you started. <laughs> and uh, that night in prayer, I felt like God said to me, yeah, you are right back where you started, but it was a great lap around the track and you're a lot stronger because of it, you know? Yeah. And so I, I did some ministry work in Philly and Los Angeles, and then I learned about servants and I thought, these are my people, you know, everyone in servants felt called to live with the poor and not just minister among them. So that's when I joined them. So it was January 1st, 2007, you know, literally New Year's Day and the start of a new chapter in my life. Wow, when I moved that's to incredible. And I, I, somewhere along the way I, I read, as I was doing my research on Jason, is that uh, you did not have a love for rats or for cockroaches at that, at that point. And, and yet you set all that aside and decided to go live with them as well, right? Yes, <laughs> there's some great rats and cockroach stories I could tell, but I don't know if that's the direction we want to go. <laughs> Let's not go there. But um, in amongst that, you are um, really um, when you say you're in when you say you're in in that community, living that community. Physically, where are you? I mean, do, do you have? Did they provide housing for you, or were you on the street, or how did all that work? Yeah. So when, when we moved there, I was the first uh, person to join the, the founding couple. Um, they had previously spent about eight years in the slums of Cambodia. And so they were going to start this sending office uh, slash community. Right. And so they got there about two months before I did. And um, at first we were in the downtown east side, but it was all these temporary one, two month rentals we could get because the Olympics were coming in 2010. So no one wanted to rent for too long, right? And so just like most of our neighbors, we were struggling to find housing. So um, that first year we were mostly in the downtown east side. There was one week where the Salvation Army actually were starting to form a uh, transitional housing for women, but they didn't have the, the house open yet. So they let us stay there for a couple of weeks. Uh, there was one week where uh, we weren't sure where we were going to go. And so my teammate Craig and I, we thought, well, let's just spend a week voluntarily homeless on the streets of the downtown east side and try to understand what our neighbors are going through. And it was eye opening. You know, we went into that week thinking the greatest need was food, hunger. Uh, but we found out during that week on the streets that you could get free food 23 times a day in the downtown <laughs> east side. No one was starving for food, but they were starving for friendship. You know, oh, loneliness wow. was pervasive. Uh, if you weren't homeless on the streets, you tended to live in what was called the single room occupancy uh, SROs. And they're about the size of a walk-in closet. So you're living alone, whether you're on, on the streets or in those SROs. Uh, and so we felt like hospitality was going to be our main form of ministry. In other words, not, not Martha Stewart, right? <laughs> not that kind of hospitality, but, but welcoming in those who are not normally the, the recipients of welcome. 
And so by the second year, we got uh, two two-bedroom apartments. That was the whole top floor of um, a, a two-story building right on Hastings Street. So it was right in the epicenter of the downtown east side. And we had that for a few years and then ended up getting a house just a block away. So also right in the downtown east side. And what was the reception like to all of that from the people who lived there? I mean, were they open to hospitality? Yeah, very much. You know, it, it took on different forms. Um, one of the main things we did was just, uh, you know, open up our home for dinners um, six nights a week at first. And then we, we cut it down to five nights a week to make it a little more sustainable. Um, but that wasn't just feeding our neighbors. You know, our neighbors came and joined us and helped cook with us. We'd uh, laugh together at the dinner table. They'd help clean the dishes afterwards. You know, we tried to be family with them. Often there'd be a impromptu, you know, we pull out a guitar and there'd be a spontaneous uh, worship time, kind of an eclectic mix of ACDC and Amazing Grace, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so that was one form of ministry. Um, we did a lot of volunteering outside of our house as well. One of the other main ministries was called Prehab. Uh, someone, Craig, with a marketing degree came up with that name. Uh, and we, what happened was we noticed a number of our neighbors would hit rock bottom. They'd want to break free from their addictions. So they'd go to one of the numerous drug rehab uh, programs in the neighborhood. And the programs were always full. So you had to wait for someone to drop out or graduate. And so what all the programs required was you'd have to go back each day to say you still want in. Otherwise, they take your name off the waiting list every day and to take wow. a test, a P test, you know, uh, be in a cup, check to make sure you haven't been using drugs. Well, wow. you know, the devil tempts all of us the most when we're alone. And so a number of our neighbors who had hit rock bottom, we'd see them fall back into their addictions because they're walking the streets and, and drug dealers were not hidden there. They just tried, the police just tried to kind of corral and keep them within the downtown east side. You know, I, I've i numerous times heard drug dealers shouting out what drugs they had while cops were giving jaywalking tickets right next oh to them. Gosh. So, oh um, gosh. And so we started prehab and that was basically saying, hey, why don't you come live with us? If, as long as you promise not to bring any drug paraphernalia, you know, we got kids in, the, in, in this place, so we need to keep them safe. But if, as long as you promise to not bring any drug paraphernalia in, then we'll have one of us walk down with you to the rehab place every day. Um, and so you're not alone. And you can join in our community life. We don't have a TV. Here's some good books. Hint, hint, you know. Um, <laughs> you can help. Just good conversations. And we saw so many lives transformed from this time. Some people who went through prehab ended up joining our community. Uh, one gentleman, uh, actually, um, he was about halfway through rehab. And it was his first Sunday, he was allowed to leave the program and go with a, a van full of, of uh, others from the program to go to church. And uh, it just happened to be that one of my uh, colleagues was preaching at that church that Sunday. And uh, he heard this colleague share about ministering among the poor in Cambodia. And afterwards, this gentleman came up to my colleague, uh, Craig, and said, I believe God's calling me to be a missionary in Cambodia. And you know, if that if, if that person had said that to me, uh, man, I, I probably would have been like, well, why don't you get out of rehab first, you know? But Craig, thankfully, was like, okay, I'll start coming down to the rehab place and I'll start teaching you Khmer and we'll start learning that language. And uh, afterwards, he joined our community and uh, became known as, as the weeping pastor because he would just always be moved to tears when he'd tell others about what God was doing in his life. And sure enough, a couple years later, he moved to Cambodia and he's been there about 13 years now and is doing amazing uh, oh, work man. among the poor there. I love that. I mean, that was one of my uh, my asks today on this interview is to tell tell me a trans transformation story, hmm. and there it is, man. That is that is beautiful. That's great. Do you communicate with him? Still hear from him? Do you? And, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, okay. Yeah. Cool. yeah, we talked just maybe six months ago. So all right, that's yeah. great. So when you were in Vancouver, uh, there was a there was a, a kind of a, a shocking surprise that uh, developed uh, around you that changed things for you a little bit, at least mentally. Uh, tell us about that story. So I moved to the downtown east side thinking of myself as a peacemaker. In other words, I, I believed God was asking me to contend for the flourishing of this beautiful yet very broken neighborhood. And I knew about some of the statistics I've already mentioned about the, the rates of homelessness, drug addictions, prostitution, et cetera. But that was about the extent of the homework I had done before coming. And so I was blindsided when just three weeks after I arrived, 
the jury trial began in a nearby courthouse for the man who we would all soon learn was Canada's deadliest serial killer. His name is Robert Picton. Wow. And so for over a decade, Picton would periodically drive into the downtown east side, pick up one of the women engaged in sex work, take her back to his farm, butcher her, and feed her remains to his pigs. Oh my and so by the time of his arrest, he had killed 49 women as he would confess to an undercover cop posing as a cellmate. And so, you know, needless to say, my neighbors were, they were scared. You know, what, what if the killings continued? What if he didn't work alone? What if there was a copycat? Um, they were just distraught. You know, many of Picton's victims were their friends, the, the closest thing to family, many of them ever knew. Wow. And they were, they were also angry and they had every right to be. I mean, Picton would never have been able to kill so many women. If his victims had been prominent women from the center of society. Oh. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it didn't take long before my neighborhood's brokenness broke me. And I remember just feeling like, you know, I came here thinking of myself as a peacemaker, but I have no idea how to make peace in this context. Hmm. And so one day I dragged myself to church with what felt like my last ounce of energy. And it turned out to be Palm Sunday. And like many churches do on Palm Sunday, this church turned the day into a joyous occasion. You know, so the kids waved palm branches, parading through the sanctuary, the choir sang upbeat hymns, and everyone chanted Hosanna, right? But I was just in no mood to participate. I was burnt out. I know that now. <laughs> and wow. uh, so I, I just sat in the pew. And when the congregation stood to sing another happy tune, I remember just crying out to God. And you're, you're getting both stories for me where God answers one of my prayers quickly. It doesn't normally happen this way. So there was that chapel <laughs> where, you know, I said, God, if you can use an Amish man, you could use me. Well, this time as I sat in the pew, I, I could just cry out to God. And I said, Lord, I'm a failure of a peacemaker, but I believe you're still in the resurrection business. I believe you still breathe new life into dying communities. So I beg you, teach me the things that make for peace. And pretty much right after that song ended, the pastor got up and began to deliver a feel-good message. And again, I was in no mood to participate. <laughs> so um, that pastor is a great guy and a good friend. So, um, But uh, that particular Sunday, I just thought, oh, I'll, I'll open my Bible and I'll just see what one of the gospel writers wrote about Palm Sunday. And I randomly chose Luke's gospel. And I noticed something that day that I had never noticed before. Because Luke says that as Jesus made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, riding the donkey, the crowds are waving palm branches, chanting Hosanna, right? It actually says that while the crowds were shouting cheers, Jesus was shedding tears. And I had never noticed that before. Maybe it was because for the first time ever, my emotions matched our Savior's grief instead of the crowd's glee, right? Yeah. And, uh, Thankfully, we don't have to speculate about what was causing Jesus' sorrow because Luke goes on to say that when he could hold back his grief no more, he cried out for all to hear, if only you knew on this of all days the things that make for peace. And that just blew me away. You know, all those years ago, as I sat in that pew, I realized if I was ever going to learn how to confront injustice and contend for peace in this neighborhood, then I needed to study the greatest peacemaker's greatest week, which is what we call Holy Week. Oh man. Oh man. And there, I love this. I love the, the, the two, the two stories side by side there, the, the story, the two callings, if you will. Yeah. Um, so at this point you've been in the, you've been in Vancouver for how long? Um, is it I was there about three years. Three years, okay. Yeah. And then uh, after that, we moved to Indonesia to help start a community there. And so, were you? Did you stay in Vancouver through the duration of the the trial and all of that? Or um, yeah, we were there for that. Yeah. Yeah. Was he convicted? I hope. Yes. So, okay. Yeah, not of all forty nine, but the, you know they brought enough cases that he's imprisoned for life. Yeah. Yeah. And he probably still alive. I'm guessing. We don't know. I guess I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure he is. Yeah, it doesn't really doesn't matter that much. That's a going down a rabbit hole that we don't need to go down <laughs> right now. Uh, so there was a, there was an area that I, that you 
um, opened my eyes to regarding uh, evangelism mm -hmm. and kind of your there either the uh, a, a different look at evangelism from uh, the guy standing on the street corner sh shouting scripture. Um, y y your idea about evangelism is what? Sure. And, and let me so rather than just throw you to the wolves there the, the idea of because <laughs> the, the story i had read about was the idea is about um the the, the concept of uh fascination um uh inviting uh interrogation or questions so that's that's kind of where i'm i'm going here yeah yeah well you know, growing up in that Baptist church, I was taught to verbally evangelize, right? And we would go to like Walmart and hand out water bottles and try to have a conversation and hand out a tract with the four spiritual laws, you name it, right? And um, and it wasn't very effective, right? <laughs> but I remember one night uh, reading, I think it's in First Peter, if I remember right, maybe First Peter chapter 2, I want to say verse 15 and 16, but don't, don't hold me to that. But it, it's where... Uh, the verse says, always be ready to give a defense or a reason for the hope that's in you when people ask, right? And, uh, and I remember in prayer one night just feeling like, you know, the first thought I had was, well, when was the last time someone else initiated and asked me to give a reason for the hope they see in me? I mean, on my best of days, I was trying to tell others about Jesus, but when was the last time someone else initiated? And then the next thought came on my mind, and it was, well, perhaps the reason few people ever ask you that is because they don't see you hoping in anything different than what the world hopes in. Hmm. And, and, you know, in Vancouver, in some ways you could look at our Christian community there and you could say we were really a lot about justice and, and peacemaking, right? But I also, I think it was the, one of the most fruitful seasons of evangelism that I'd ever seen. And I think what some of it comes down to is um, it wasn't, you know, in the book uh, on Monday Thursday, I talk about how one person can talk about the love of God and others can listen. And at best they can say, wow, now I've heard about God's love. Two people who are committed to loving each other as Christ has loved them can demonstrate that love. So in other words, others can look at it and observe it and say, wow, now I've not only just heard about God's love, now I've seen it. But once you have three or more people who are committed to loving each other as Christ has loved them, you have a community. So picture like a triangle, right? And then that creates a space into which others can be invited. So picture them coming into the middle of that triangle. And now no, no longer do they just hear about God's love or see God's love being demonstrated. Now you can experience God's love. And so in Vancouver, we we actually found it hard to keep up with people's questions when they join us for, for dinners, right? Or they stay with us for pre-op. Why don't you have a TV? Why would you leave your college educated? Why would you move into the downtown east side? You know? Um, and it was great opportunities to share about Christ. And it, it, what's interesting is in the book of Acts, to give a quick little Bible study, every single time a sermon's delivered by one of the apostles, it's preceded by some action or event that causes the crowds to be fascinated or infuriated. <laughs> but either way, whether it's accusation or asking a question, it's this fascination preceding explanation. Huh. Huh. That, well, that really struck home for me because I, um, I'm a kind of a, a late bloomer uh, Christian. I was mm. raised a Catholic, but um, didn't really... Uh, find a relationship with Jesus until later in life. Yeah. And so it's always been a struggle for me to try to evangelize, you know, to be, you know, a Bible thump and evangelist. So yeah. it was comforting to know that uh, you don't need to do that. Um, just live your life so that people see the difference, you know. Yeah, so yeah. That was you know, I, I think a mistake a lot of Christian groups make in the States is to think that it's, it's upon us to persuade others to come to Christ. I, I like to to, I tend to use the word testify more than evangelize. My job's to testify to the goodness of God um, as I also seek to live it out, but it's the Holy Spirit's job to convince and persuade. Yeah, I love it. And that's kind of the the uh, concept behind this podcast is, is those testimonies. How is God uh, living amongst us 
and showing off for us uh, on a day-to-day basis in real time. So yeah, 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 yeah. So let's talk about um, the book. Um, the book is uh, you. You touched on the book, but I, I kind of want to jump into um, the the thing that was amazing to me is that we always think of um, of, of Holy Week as being Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter, and uh, that's a wrap pretty much. But you <laughs> yeah. go into each and every day uh, and kind of explain. Uh, and you don't need to do that now because we want people to buy the book and read it. Uh, <laughs> but just to kind of a, 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 gl- a gloss over or a, or a short story on what happens on each of those days during Holy Week. Yeah. You know, when I was researching this book, this book, that's both a commentary on each day of Holy Week, but also a training manual for peacemakers, right? It extracts, it looks at how Jesus waged peace on each day and then extracts lessons from that. Uh, one of the things that struck me was the gospel writers actually front load their coverage of the week. So for example, Tuesday is the most talked about day of Holy Week. But like like you said, when it comes to our churches commemorating Holy Week, we tend to celebrate Palm Sunday and then do nothing else until at best Monday, Thursday comes along. So we brush aside the events of Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday as incidental. But Matthew, for example, has more to say about Tuesday of Holy Week than all the other days of Holy Week combined. <laughs> and so in writing this book, I, I wanted to do justice uh, to that observation and, and really front load the coverage. And so my concern was that, you know, in our rush to get to the cross, we often sever it from its context. We, uh, we uproot it from its context and, and we sever it from the life of the one who gives it meaning. And I'm convinced that Jesus was crucified on Friday precisely because of how he sought to contend for peace on the previous days of Holy Week. And when we fail to realize that, then we may actually cling to the cross of Christ for our salvation, yet be embracing the very approach to peacemaking that justified nailing Jesus to a cross. Mm. So to give a quick, you know, 30 second rundown of Holy Week, there's the triumphal entry on Sunday. He makes it into Jerusalem. He looks around the temple. It's a reconnaissance mission. He goes back to Bethany for the night. He comes back on Monday and there's the temple cleansing scene where he drives out the sheep and the cattle, the animal sellers, the money changers. Um, Tuesday, he actually has the audacity to go back to the temple. Uh, And it's that lengthy day I've already mentioned where the religious leaders basically ask four baited questions to try to get him to misspeak and cause his followers to turn on him. But he aces their unanswerable tests. And then he goes on the offensive and uh, critiques the religious leaders. Uh, And at the end of that day, when they're leaving the temple, uh, his disciples are uh, in awe of how big the stones are of all the buildings. You might remember that. And Jesus says, you know, there's going to come a time where not one of these stones are going to remain on top of each other. All these buildings are going to be torn down, right? Um, Wednesday is kind of the calm before the storm. It's the middle of Holy Week. It's kind of like you're in the eye of a hurricane, right? And um, there's three brief but very important scenes. The religious leaders gather to plot how, what they what they can do to arrest and kill Jesus. Um, Jesus is hanging out in Simon the leper's home. Uh, and this is the scene where an, an unnamed woman uh, in the synoptic Gospels comes and anoints Jesus with costly uh, perfume and, and uh, wipes his feet as well with her hair. Um, and then Judas, there's the third scene. Judas leaves uh, to, to start betraying Jesus. Monday, Thursday, I think we know about the, the Last Supper uh, in the upper room. Uh, Eucharist, or we might say the Last Supper, um, some great teaching there, the farewell discourse. And then there's the garden scene where he gets arrested. Friday, we know about the crucifixion. Saturday, we tend to overlook, we call it Sat- Silent Saturday, and I talk about that a bit in the book, and then Resurrection Sunday. Uh-huh. And, and along the way, you go into a lot of detail on each of those, and it's and it's just fascinating how you uh, folks, how did, did you, was that, a, was that a God gift? Did he say, I guess it was based on your reading that segment at that particular time in the church, uh, in your moment of desperation. Um, but uh, how about writing the book? Did you didn't know to be writing it? Was that a God thing for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, maybe others, maybe some of your listeners can relate to this. So, so 
you know, when I was in that church on Palm Sunday, all those years ago in Vancouver, the, the thought that entered my mind was not write a book on this. The thought was, uh, I need to study Holy Week for myself so I can seek to cultivate God's shalom in this community. And so it took years of trying to study Holy Week, Jesus' last week, and trying to apply it together with other, you know, a community of other Christians. Um, but years later, maybe six years later, I started to sense, you know, maybe, maybe this should become a book. I, I couldn't, and for me, I, it's not that I feel called to be a writer. It's that I found a topic that I couldn't find anyone else writing on, and it felt like it was important for the church to hear. And so by that point, I was in seminary, but I think that uh, theological training was important to help with the book, um, and, but also studying the craft of writing. So it, it took me about four years to write this book, you know. Um, so for those who maybe feel like God's calling them to, to write something, that doesn't necessarily mean you can just sit down right away and start writing, right? You got to live it. You got to study it and you got to study the craft of writing. Just like if God calls you to be a doctor, you don't just go and start practicing medicine right away, right? That takes training. So, so yeah, it, it was a long process for me. And you and then uh, you schooled yourself on how to find an audience for your book, which I also mm -hmm. thought was fascinating. Um, tell us a little bit about that. It was, it was you can you can put a book out there, but how do you get people to find it and to read it? Well, some of that is you know I listened to a number of podcasts on book marketing and stuff and learning how to find the felt need of your target audience. But really, for me, it was just knowing there's others. You know, you don't have to live in the Camden, New Jersey's or in the downtown East Side. But if your heart breaks over injustice and you long to make a positive difference in the world, I thought this book is going to be for you. Um, but yeah, certainly, you know, nowadays. Um, the publishers don't do most of the marketing. It's actually mostly on the author. So learning to do podcasts like this, radio interviews like this, and um, uh, sharing with groups. Um, yeah, all sorts of different marketing kind of ways to yeah, try to connect. You're kind of a master at uh, using ad Facebook advertising, for one thing, right? You, you trained yourself on what works and what doesn't work, and you, you really dug deep into that as well. I did. Yeah. You know, to get traditionally published nowadays, you need to have what's called a platform, right? And the main thing they want to see is your email list. And so what a lot of authors do is they create what's called a reader magnet, a free giveaway. And so I created a, a brief little resource called 100 Early Christian Quotes on Not Killing. It's just a, a one-page introduction and then 100 quotes from the early church on the impermissibility of violence, uh, complete with, uh, you know, end notes so you can look at the original source material. And so that's where I learned how to use Facebook ads was promoting that to build up enough of a platform for traditional publishers to actually be interested in looking at the book. Yeah. So what is what's Jason up to these days? Are you um, are you pursuing um, your advocacy of peace in some way? Are you uh, are you contemplating another book or what's going on with you right now? Great question. Yeah, I mean, some of it, to be honest, is I got three young kids and I'm the primary at home parent. So there is a lot of just driving the kids to and from events. But um, definitely, you know, I volunteer a lot at my church down here. I'm on the board still for servants. Um, as a family, like my wife volunteers at a Catholic worker uh, shelter as well. Um, but, but, you know, at the very end of my book, I, I go back to that Palm Sunday lament from Jesus if only you knew the things that make for peace. And I, I tell three stories of, of Christians um, who I felt like had learned the things that make for peace and then lived it out. And I, I end by, by saying to the reader, but it's also to myself, I said, you know, we live in a time when the majority of Christians or perhaps just the most vocal ones have chosen the way of the hammer, this, this peace through force, this imposed peace. Uh, but after journeying together day by day through Holy Week, you, and speaking to the reader, now know the things that make for peace. You now know how Jesus makes peace, which means only one question remains to be answered. What will you do with this knowledge? And that's the last sentence of the book, that question. And that question is for me just as much as it is for others. And so I've been asking myself for that, you know, what, what will I do with this knowledge? How will I continue to try to be a peacemaker who contends for peace? Um, and I'm still trying to figure that out. I live down in Houston, Texas now. And so there's lots of different ways to get involved in working for justice in, the, in this community.
Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and all of the things that are going on in our society today kind of, you know, pose the question, what do we do? You know, there's so much division in our country um, and, and so much violence in our country. And then you, yeah. then you look at Ukraine and all of the, um, you know, horrible atrocities that are going on there. And you say, you know, what can I do? Yeah. And I guess that's what you're entering the book with is what, what can we do? Any suggestions? <laughs> Well, I'd say find at least two other people because then you have community who are committed to trying to cultivate this peace to to nurture God's shalom in your actual locality. Or perhaps you join a group like Servants where you try to contend for peace in a place where it's painfully absent, right? But either way, as the community, you creatively then to begin to ask, how can we work for peace here in this place that we find ourselves? So I think it's going to look different depending on who's in your community and what's, you know, what are the, the assets and the, um, what's beautiful and broken about your particular place. Mm. Cool. Well, tell us, so the, the book is available. Uh, it's available everywhere. It's on Amazon. Uh, it's on your website, I believe. Um, and it is just, it's fair, freshly published. Did you, did you publish it just during um, Holy Week this year? Yeah, it came out February 1st, so just in time for Lent. And there are discussion questions at the back. You can actually do one chapter per week during Lent, leading it into uh, Holy Week. So yeah, it's Fight Like Jesus, How Jesus Waged Peace Throughout Holy Week. Uh, it's also available in audiobook form, too. So you can get ebook, you know, paperback or audiobook. Yeah, that's how I got it. Audiobook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Jason, you're an amazing young man. You've got a, a long life ahead of you, and I can see that there's going to be... Um, uh, a lot of peacemaking through the next decades and I really appreciate all that you've done and for spending time with us today. Thank you. Thanks Rick. Thanks for having me. So I guess we got to ask ourselves where is our own Calcutta? Where can we serve and fight like Jesus for justice and peace in our own neighborhoods and families? You just got to have eyes to see. Thanks to Jason Porterfield for his awesome book and his time with us today on Amazing Greats and Telling His Story. Amazing Greats is produced by Clem Daniels and is published every other Wednesday. Thanks for listening and sharing our podcast. You're the best. God bless.